Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome to another exciting episode of Calling the Divine TV. My name is Yujiro Seki. I'm a director, writer, and the producer of the documentary Carving the Divine. Carving the Divine is about the Buddhist sculptors of Japan, and I'm ready to present it for the first time in the world. But before I do so, I thought it would be a great idea to introduce basic concept of Buddhism and the history of Buddhism so that when you guys finally watch my documentary, you guys can watch it at the maximum value. So today, we're going to be talking about something super special. I know every day I talk about something special, but today's topic is something. Uh, yes, we're going to go into uh, deeper uh, about the uh, uh, Nichiren Shu. Uh, we're going to talk about the Odaimoku and the Four Siddhanta or Four Aims. Ah, that's a, such a big idea. So I don't even know how to start it. Uh, so I invited somebody who's an expert on this subject. I would love to introduce to you, Reverend Ryuei Mark Comic. Welcome, welcome to our show. Uh, thank you, very nice to be here. Uh, I, I hope we can make this exciting. And uh, I, I don't pretend to be an expert in this, but uh, I've been giving some thought to it and would like to share my thoughts and experience uh, with the four Siddhanta or four aims. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. So uh, just in case for the people who don't know anything about you, so please introduce yourself. Okay, uh, well, my name is Michael McCormick. Uh, my Dharma name is uh, Liu Ei, which uh, is, uh, is composed of two characters, uh, Liu for dragon and A, which means English or splendid. So uh, I'm the dragon of the English language. I uh, have been practicing Nichiren Buddhism in one form or another since I was uh, in high school. That was back in 1985. Uh, and then I, uh, originally I, was, I lived in Pennsylvania on the east coast of the United States. And as with many people, uh, you know, I, I grew up in this uh, sort of a, a Christian atmosphere. My parents weren't particularly churchgoers. But you know, we had this idea that there's, you know, you get one life, one chance, and then after that, you go to either to go to heaven or you go to hell forever, and that's it. You get that one chance. Uh, so I had instead, through my mother, who liked to read a lot of New Age books, believed more in the idea of karma and rebirth. You know, the, the, you, there's many, many lifetimes, you're not just one, and you don't just go to one place forever, and it depends on what you do. And I ran into uh, Nichiren Buddhism when I was in uh, uh, high school and learned about the, the idea of that there are um, 10 worlds. There's there are six worlds of delusion, like the hells, hungry ghosts, uh, the animals, fighting demons, humans, heavens, and then four enlightened realms of the those who hear the Buddha's teachings, those who contemplate it for themselves, bodhisattvas and Buddhas, and that these are all intermixed. They, they mutually possess one another. And this was such a revelation to me. Uh, I often compare it to when you go into a huge shopping mall and it's so big, you don't know where anything is. You don't know where you are. And then you finally find that uh, sign that says you are here. And, and then there's a key and you can see where all the different stores are. And, and now you have an orientation. You know where you are, you know where you want to get to, uh, you know all the different possibilities. So when I heard this teaching of this mutual possession of these six worlds, the six worlds of delusion and four higher worlds, uh, it felt like I had finally found that map to my life. So, uh, and also I, I really resonated with the chanting of Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. I like that a lot. I like the sound of the chanting and the sound of the chanting of the sutra. So I kept following up on that, and eventually uh, in 1997, I was uh, living in California, and I had been attending a Nichiren Chu temple, and I became a disciple of the Venerable Yusho Matsuda, who was the, at the time the bishop of the Nichiren Order of North America, and I became his apprentice, a uh, priest. I took Tokudo, became a shami. Uh, four years later, I... Uh, uh, finished the training to become an Nichiren Shu priest at Shingo Dojo at Mount Minobu in Japan. And since then, I've been teaching and translating, kind of, and commenting and, and helping facilitate practice for people in the San Francisco Bay Area. So, sorry if that introduction took a little too long. But 
So that's who I am and what I am about. Mm, mm. Exciting, exciting. Uh, yeah, you, today uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, uh, Four Siddhanta, but you know, before we do it, uh, we want to we recap what Odaiboku, uh, since you told me Nammyo uh, Horen Gekyo, you know, I know that a lot of people already know about it, but you know, uh, or they think know about it. Uh, yeah. So, you know, just uh, uh, in case for those people, please uh, recap, recap on uh, uh, what's, uh, yeah, Odaiboku, please. Sure. So it's actually written right behind me, the Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. So uh, Daimoku or O Daimoku, if you add the extra honorific, means the sacred title or august title. And, and in this case, it refers to the title of the Lotus Sutra. So the Lotus Sutra in Sanskrit, the title is Sadharma Pandarika Sutra. And Sadharma means the, the uh, true Dharma or wonderful dharma. Uh, Pandarika means the white lotus flower. So it's a particular kind of lotus flower, uh, the most beautiful of them, supposedly. And uh, sutra is related to the English word suture. And so sutra means like a thread. So it's a, a, a thread of the Buddhist discourse. So the Sadharma Pandarika Sutra is the discourse on the lotus flower or lotus blossoming of the wonderful dharma. So it's the full flowering of all the Buddha's teachings. And when this was translated into Chinese characters, it became, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce this horribly, but the Chinese characters are miao fa lian hua jing. And in Japan, it's pronounced myo ho ring ge kyo. And added to that, to the front of it as a prefix, are the two characters that in Chinese would be namo, and in Japan it's pronounced namu. And these two characters, uh, the first two up there, uh, they relate back to the uh, Indian or the Sanskrit word namas, from which we get namaste, like in the greeting. So namas in this case means I devote myself to, or I take refuge in, or um, I dedicate myself. So in this case, the uh, chanting of the sacred title of the Lotus Sutra is Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. I devote myself to the teaching of the full blossoming of the wonderful Dharma. And when we chant Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, we're not saying that we dedicate ourselves to a book. <laughs> because if you read the Lotus Sutra, it, it seems to be talking just about itself. The Lotus Sutra as a text is talking about something called the Lotus Sutra. But in this case, the, the Myoho Renge Kyo, it's not a text, but it's, it's the flowering of the Buddha's teaching, which is what the text Lotus Sutra is about. So we're dedicating, our, dedicating ourselves through our chanting, not to a concrete text or book, but to that full flowering of the Buddha's enlightenment and true intention, which is what the text Lotus Sutra is trying to awaken us to. So I hope that makes sense. It was also chanted at times in liturgies before Nichiren, uh, but Nichiren uh, Shonin uh, made it the central part of his practice. So especially we consider April 28, 1253, when he returned from his studies in Kyoto to his home monastery Seichoji as the first time he chanted uh, on the hillside overlooking the ocean at the rising sun the Daimoku as his primary form of practice and would present it that way to people from then on. Mm, mm, wonderful. Thank you for a nice introduction. So I have a statue of something today. Uh, yes, I, obviously this is a statue of Reverend Nichiren, but you know, we don't know that much about him. Uh, we talk about him a little bit, but we want to know a little bit more about him. And uh, if you could uh, explain to us what this statue represent, that would be wonderful. Sure, so uh, that statue, in fact, I, I have one here. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, uh, that uh, one of the people who practice with my Sangha uh, gave to us. And he is also holding the uh, sutra in one hand and then the other, he's hand, uh, in his right hand, he's holding what's called a shaku, which is, it's been translated variously as a, a, like a ritual baton or a scepter or something like that. 
it, what it was originally was court nobles would, would hold that uh, and well, on the right hand, they would hold that and they could write notes on the back. So it's almost like a combination talking stick. Like if you're having a discussion or a debate, if you're holding that up, you get to speak and a cheat sheet because it have all the notes on the back. So what that statue is representing is Nietzsche in debate mode because when he was a monk at Mount Hiei, he was trained in the way of uh, practicing Buddhist deb uh, debate, formal discussions. And of course, in his left hand, he's holding a scroll of the Lotus Sutra. So I, I guess that's a good way of introducing uh, who Nietzsche was and what he was about. Nietzsche was, unlike many other founders of uh, the, the Japanese schools, uh, was born to a very poor family. Uh, he says they were fishermen. Uh, they may have been of uh, samurai background, or his father may have been at one time, but in any case, he was either a fisherman or, or like the head man of a fishing village. And through his connections, he was able to have his son, who became Nietzsche, and, uh, g receive education at the local Buddhist temple, Seichoji, which at that time was connected with the Tendai school. And at a, uh, when he went there for training, he later decided he would become a monk. And he then continued his studies in uh, Kamakura, which was the center of the shogunate at that time, the Kamakura shogunate. And then he went on for further studies at Kyoto on Mount Hiei. And uh, he also studied with the six original schools of Japanese Buddhism, the so-called six schools of Nara, and then he went down to uh, Mount Koya, studied with uh, the Shingon school. So he studied all the various forms of Buddhism that were available to him at that time. And his question was, what is the true practice? What is Buddhism really about? Because, you know, these people say you should just sit. And these people say you should chant uh, the name of the Buddha of infinite light and be reborn in a pure land after death. These people say you should do esoteric rituals and try to become a Buddha in this very body. But... So there's all these different teachings. What is the true teaching? And especially what is the true teaching that will help everybody? You know, not just the, the elite or the aristocrats who the people who have the education and the time and the money to do expensive rituals. Um, you know, not, not just a certain select group of people, but, but some practice that, that is for everybody. Um, the poor as well as the rich, the, the uneducated as well as the educated, the uh, lay people as well as the clergy. And after uh, many years of study and reading the sutras, and especially reading the commentaries and writings of the founders of the Tiantai school in China, uh, the great master Tiantai and uh, Miao Lo, he decided or had the um, conviction that the Lotus Sutra was where all the other teachings are leading to. And that the reason for that is because the two most important teachings of the Lotus Sutra for Nichiren in, in the Tendai school is one, that the Buddha is not teaching different goals for different people. He's teaching one goal, the one vehicle, that everyone can attain Buddhahood. That's, that's the ultimate goal for everyone. So there may be intermediary goals or provisional goals, but really everyone who enters the Buddhist path and takes up Buddhist practice will attain Buddhahood. And the second thing was that Buddhahood, the, the Shakyamuni Buddha in chapter 16 Lotus Sutra says, you think I became enlightened 40 years ago before I taught this particular teaching while I was sitting under the Bodhi tree, but actually I've been a Buddha for bazillions of years in the past, more than you can count, and I will continue to be a Buddha present, helping people to attain Buddhahood quickly. So there's this idea that Buddhahood is something that has no beginning and no end effectively. So therefore, Buddhahood is not some total uh, end point annihilation. So, you know, someone becomes a Buddha, teaches, and then enters nirvana and disappears forever. Uh, and also, Buddhahood isn't something that can be just attained in the future. Somehow, Buddhahood is always present in some manner in our lives. So these are the two most important teachings for Nietzsche and this idea that everybody can practice the one vehicle or that, that all the teachings and practices are the one vehicle and that Buddhahood is without beginning or end, and especially as represented by what we call the eternal Shakyamuni Buddha. The other thing is that 
the Tendai school, while it did teach these things, is really an umbrella school. It has many different ways of practicing Buddhism in Tendai. You can do Shikan meditation, which means tranquility and insight. You can chant Nambutsu. You can do Mikyo, esoteric ceremonies. Uh, all of these are ways of practicing various forms of Buddhism in the spirit of the Lotus Sutra. But Nichiren wanted a way that people could directly practice the Lotus Sutra. So that's why he chose to use the title as the main practice. And just as everybody was able to practice Nembutsu in his day, thanks to the teaching of Honen, Nichiren decided that the Daimoku would be accessible to everyone. They could just chant the Daimoku. And according to chapters 17 through 19 of the Sutra, the, the merit of accepting the Lotus Sutra and rejoicing in it, which is what happens when you chant Daimoku, uh, is greater than all the merit of you know, practicing the six perfections of generosity and morality and patience and all that for thousands of years. Like somehow all of the merit of many, many lifetimes of practicing the six bodhisattva perfections are in, wrapped up in Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. And in fact, he, he says it's like for those who can't understand the sublime teaching of the Tendai school, uh, it's like the, the Buddha has wrapped them all up uh, in the gem of Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. Wow. Beautifully said. I'm very moved. So uh, now it's time for, uh, for us to talk about the four Siddhanta or four aims. What is it? Why is it so important? Okay. Well, the, the four Siddhanta, or that's a Sanskrit word, the four Siddhanta, the four aims is found in a treatise called the Treatise on the Great Perfection of Wisdom that is attributed to Nagarjuna but was translated, it may have been written and are compiled by Kumara Jiva. Uh, he was the great translator who also translated the Lotus Sutra, who, who translated it into the Myoho Renge Kyo that we chant today. And this was in the, uh, uh, if I'm remembering it, the fifth century, beginning of the fifth century. So this is a very long treatise, a treatise on the great perfection of wisdom. And it's very much a centerpiece for the studies of the Tendai school and Nichiren quotes it many times himself. And in this treatise, Nagarjuna, uh, or perhaps Kumara Jiva, lays out this idea that there are four aims in teaching Buddhism. And, and the first is the worldly aim, that if you can teach people about cause and effect, and the idea if you make good causes, you'll be able to attain another birth as a human or in the heavenly realm, and you'll get yourself in a good circumstances where you can practice Buddhism and attain liberation. Uh, but if you practice, uh, or, but if you commit bad causes, you'll fall into these lower realms of the hells and hungry ghosts, basically like undermine your own life and hurt the people around you. Uh, that if you can understand this, you'll be able to avoid bad causes and make good causes and at least have worldly happiness, at least, but more importantly, set up a situation where you can transcend mere worldly happiness. So that's the first aim, the worldly aim. And the second and third aims are kind of branches of that. The second aim uh, could be called the individualized aim. And what it is about is using your practice to cultivate the strengths that you already have. So say that you're a very uh, loving devotional person, then you could practice devotion to the Buddha, you know, offering flowers, uh, uh, circumambulating stupas, things like that, that, that will help increase the devotion you already have. Or if you're a very generous person, then, you know, practice generosity, uh, donate your time and your money and, and things that you have to help the people around you. So you find what you already have and you make it stronger. Maintain it and make it stronger. The, the third siddhanta is the therapeutic so, you know, we all have the three poisons, greed, hatred, delusion. So there are Buddhist practices that you can use to counteract those. So if you're a very uh, uh, lustful person, for instance, you can, you can go into a graveyard and, and meditate on death and decomposition so that you won't be so attached to uh, the body. Uh, that's a, a classical Buddhist practice or if you're somebody who's constantly resentful and full of hate, you would meditate on cultivating loving kindness, both for yourself and for others, and even to people that you don't get along with, and then try to radiate that loving kindness out to all people. So that's another classical Buddhist form of meditation. 
Uh, if you, your problem is distraction, then you would meditate on the breath or chanting you know, a phrase like the Daimoku. Of course, in this case, Daimoku can be used for any of these practices, really, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, if you're deluded and don't understand how the world works and you would meditate on causes and conditions, you know, especially the 12-fold chain of dependent origination. So this would be the therapeutic uh, siddhanta or aim to overcome your weaknesses. And as I said, th these are two, like two branches of the, of the worldly siddhanta. And then finally, the fourth siddhanta is the supreme meaning siddhanta, which means your aim is to realize the true nature of reality. Uh, beyond just conditionality, you see the unconditioned, you see the empty nature of all things. And I, I think this teaching is very important because in my experience of Buddhism in America, uh, I found that a lot of the people who chanted Daimoku, uh, at least initially, are very focused on like worldly happiness and success. You know, they, they want stability in their lives. You know, they want a decent place to live, a, a good job, loving relationships, uh, things like that. Um, and oftentimes, you know, they, they think of the, these goals of, of attaining the unconditioned and nirvana and all that is they're not interested in that. That's that's something for for monks or or people who are in a very uh, uh, elite kind of place and they're not interested in that. Maybe they will, maybe they will and do become interested in that eventually, but th that's not where their initial attraction is. And then on the other hand, there are many people who practice like Zen meditation or different forms of Tibetan Buddhism or Vipassana. And, and sometimes their goal is very sublime. They want to attain enlightenment. You know, maybe they've had worldly success uh, and they see that it doesn't make them happy. So, you know, they, they leave everything and enter a monastery or go on long retreats. And the problem is, is these two groups, you know, the, the people who are practicing like uh, the, the, the Zen or Mahamudra, Dzogchen, whatever, they kind of look down on the people who are just chanting for worldly things. And, and they think, you know, they're just being superstitious. They don't really understand what Buddhism is. And then the people who are using chanting to improve their lives on, on a daily, um, in their uh, daily basis, are looking at these other people going, well, you're just elitist and, and you don't understand that Buddhism is about being in the world and, and actually helping people in a practical way. So there's this kind of divide. I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but perhaps not too much. And I was very inspired, by the way, watching uh, Bishop Harada's uh, talk of the, the Buddhist Churches of America, uh, where he was talking about practical level Buddhism and truth level Buddhism. And that made me think of these four siddhantas and for some years now, I've been telling people that as Buddhist teachers, we need to teach all four levels and not just stick to one side or the other. And really when you, um, the first three siddhantas are what Bishop Harada was calling the uh, uh, practical Buddhism and the fourth siddhanta is the truth level. But really when you look at it, you know, you, you practice the worldly siddhantas long enough, you get a deeper and deeper understanding of things, of life, and you eventually end up um, at least getting closer to realization of the fourth aim. Whereas if you really get the fourth aim, you're also going to understand that you need to bring that back to the people and bring that back into life as a bodhisattva. So that means embracing the first three, at the very least, is, is skillful means to help other people. But really, I think you need to recognize all, no matter how high up you get, you, you're still going to have to find a way to get clothing, food, shelter, and handle practical realities and relationships. So, you know, once again, they're all, they need to be bound together. Um, so I, I've, I can talk about how that can be applied to Daimoku practice, but um, maybe I should stop for a second and see what question or comment. No, 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 that, that, that's exactly what I was going to ask, you know. Yeah, it was beautiful and everything, and I love the theory, and I feel I got it. I don't know if I did, but I did, I hope. But, but you know, the thing is how we can really apply it. How can I use the Odaimok to achieve uh, those four areas? That's what we are interested in. So if you can enlighten us a little bit, that would be wonderful. Okay. So, my experience with chanting initially was I, I was told uh, in, in not in Nichiren Shu, but in other groups I had practiced with that you should just chant for what you want, right? Um, 
what eventually happened was as I, as I worked through my feelings about the practice and experiences of the practice, um, it, it came that about that I would sit in front of my Butsudan uh, where my Gohonzan or, or focus devotion is enshrined and I would begin chaining Daimoku. And at first I would think about all the, the people in my life that were important to me. I would think about my parents. Um, I would think about, you know, my family and good friends. And it was kind of a, a wishing of loving kindness of may they be well and happy. And I would just kind of hold all them in the Daimoku. And after I had done that, then I would start chanting about some concern in my own life, right? Uh, like if, uh, if I needed a, a better job, for instance, you know, or if I was worried about an argument that I had with someone and how could I resolve that. So I would just start chanting about that. I, now, I wouldn't necessarily chant for a specific outcome, but my feeling was as I was chanting that with the chanting, I was presenting these problems to the Buddha in a sense, but not the Buddha as an external being but to just um, hear words kind of fail me because when we're, when we're looking at, uh, this isn't like the full 10 world mandalas, it's just the Daimoku, but whenever even the Daimoku is present, it's implied that you are participating in the ceremony in the air in the Lotus Sutra, that Shakyamuni Buddha, many treasures Buddha, all the bodhisattvas, all the gods, all of the beings gathered, you know, um, in that assembly, that you're entering into that. You're entering into this Buddha world. And in that atmosphere of practice, of being in the Buddha world, awakening your Buddha nature, uh, it kind of sheds a different light on your problems. You get a different perspective. You're stepping outside of your own narrow, worried, or greedy, or overly optimistic or whatever, or anxious perspective, and you're, you're presenting all of this just raw, real, all your worries, all your hopes, all your fears, you're just presenting it in this, this new atmosphere, this elevated atmosphere um, in the presence of the Buddha. And then you can let it go, right? At least that's my experience in my practice. You just let it go. And after a while, chanting about what's going on in my life, I would just settle down into the chant itself or just release that and just be with the daimoku just be with the sound of namu myo renge kyo namu myo renge kyo namu myo renge kyo and uh you know oftentimes just to be able to release things like that and to have that different context it allows a different answer to come to you right a different way of relating to your problem or the other person you might realize that you know, maybe this person uh, doesn't dislike me, but maybe they have a problem because I don't smile enough. I don't smile and say hello when I come to work, you know, and they think I'm the one who's being unfriendly, right? Um, or I realize maybe this other person, they have all these personal problems that have nothing to do with me, and I'm just taking them as being cold when maybe I should be a little more patient, a little more compassionate. Suddenly I would get a very different perspective on how to deal with this other person. And with that kind of insight, if I do something with it, if I try a little more to uh, enact what I've learned in my practice, and I smile, I say hello, or I'm more ready to listen instead of pass judgment, I find that my relationships improve. Um, or I find that I see opportunities I didn't see before, uh, and I'm able to take advantage of those, and then that helps improve my life. Uh, and so that's one way of applying the Daimoku. Another way is a more formal style. In Nietzsche and Shu, we have a practice called Shadaigyo, where you practice sitting meditation to um, kind of purify your thoughts and your atmosphere and get settled so that you can really chant Daimoku from a calm, centered place. And then you chant for a while, uh, usually with a taiko drum, and there's different tempos. You, you start off slow, go fast, go back to slow, and you can do that for a few cycles. And you could do this for half an hour or a couple hours. We, you know, when we were training on Mount Minobu, we did it for a couple hours or more. 
Uh, often though, here in America with lay people, we usually only do it for about half an hour, 40 minutes. But in any case, after the chanting, you go back into another si period of silence. So you can just sit with the power of the Daimoku that you just chanted. And what I discovered is in that first period of silent sitting, you could, uh, because often people have trouble just keeping their mind open and aware without anything to focus on. So one thing I realized people could focus on is the cultivation of loving kindness, or compassion, or sympathetic joy for other people, or equanimity. Uh, these are the what are called the four divine abodes, four different ways of contemplating to cultivate one's emotional state and bring it bring about a more positive feeling. So you could chant for that loving kindness, just like as I said, when I first sit in front of the Gohanzan and chant, I think about my family and and friends and other people that I'm concerned about. Um, so in this, you just sit and you think, may all beings be well and happy. Um, and, and then you just roll that over in your mind as you're sitting. And then you start chanting Daimoku. And now the Daimoku becomes a way of, of sending that loving kindness out. It becomes like a carrier wave. So that's, that's one way of cultivating the kind of loving kindness that, as I said, counteracts resentment and hateful feelings and paranoid feelings. You know, so that's an example of using the, the third aim, the therapeutic aim, you know. Um, so the Daimoku, even though it might look like the same practice all the time, just chanting Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, you know, the, the setting that you have in your mind can really change how it's being directed, either towards worldly concerns or improving yourself or addressing some kind of problem or, um, chanting with the aspiration to attain awakening for the sake of all beings, you know, the, the fourth aim. It, it is all there in the Daimoku. Mm, interesting. Uh, do you have a, uh, did you have a, some taste of like a, uh, the fourth aim? Uh, the fourth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I wouldn't presume to say, but I, I will, I have noticed that uh, over the years, um, I have calmed down a lot. Uh, maybe I would have anyway, but I'd like to think that my practice has really helped facilitate that. Um, I, I have been able to really more and more understand what uh, Nichiren and Tiantai and the Garjan and others are talking about when they say things are empty. And, you know, I, I'd like to think that my practice has really helped me, you know, bring that into my life and understand that uh, more and more and how I live. And I still make many mistakes, of course, but you know, one of the results uh, of this kind of insight is that in, in Tiantai thought, we talk about the three truths. Things are empty, but they're also provisionally existent according to causes and conditions. And the middle way holds both of these together. Uh, things are empty of a fixed self nature and because of that, they are able to exist provisionally through causes and conditions. And because things exist provisionally through causes and conditions, they don't have, or they are empty of a fixed self nature. It's not that things are empty, but provisionally existent. They're both. And this sounds very complicated and very uh, abstract, but here's what it means practically. And, and here's what I chant to be able to live in my life. That's why I chant about, to not just know these things, but to really bring them down into my heart, into my body, into the way I live. If things are empty, that means you don't get caught. That means you don't have to have hangups, that you can be fully liberated, even in the midst of life. And because emptiness also means things are provisionally existent, that means I can fully engage things and engage their causes and conditions and the causes and conditions that make my life. I, I can make life workable. So then I can be fully engaged and fully liberated at the same time. And this is what a bodhisattva needs to be. This is what bodhisattva needs to be about, to be, um, have that gracefulness in the world of being liberated, but compassionately engaged. So I, I guess uh, if, when it comes to the fourth aim, I really chant about that, to have a deeper and deeper understanding of what it means to be fully liberated and fully engaged in the world. Wow, very profound. I love it. 
I love it. So, uh, yeah, you know, uh, when we want to learn more about the Odaimoku and the, the teaching of uh, Nichiren and the uh, Nagajina and uh, all that, so where, where can we go? <laughs> um, well, uh, we have a, a, website, a website called, uh, uh, let me bring it up here, Nichiren Bay Area. It, it's just spelled one word, Nichiren Bay area.org and I have a lot of articles on there and we have a blog some of which I've written some of which uh, my disciple Mark uh, Herrig or Yugon has written uh, we also have a uh, sort of a, a bookstore link there that has links to Amazon uh, I have a book uh, I have two books on Amazon right now uh, one of them is called uh, Lotus in a Sea of Flames so just look that up under a UA Michael McCormick, and it is a uh, fictionalized biography of Nietzscheian. In other words, I, I took um, translations of his letters and I was able to create dialogues and reproduce kind of his life uh, in in a, a narrative form, like a story form. And in that, I try to um, I take the, the the reader back to Nietzschean's childhood. And so as Nietzsche is growing up and getting educated, the reader is educated in uh, the, like what was going on in 13th century Japan and, and what Nietzsche would have learned about Buddhism as a child. And so, you know, the reader is educated as Nietzsche is. So I'm able to like start at the beginning and introduce more and more and more things. Uh, the other book is called Open Your Eyes, and it is a commentary on one of Nietzsche's five major writings, the Kaimoku Show, which means open your eyes. And in a way, uh, that writing is a survey of world religion as Nietzsche understood it in 13th century Japan. So obviously he didn't know about Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, but I threw a chapter in there anyway on Western monotheism, uh, looking at it with the principles that Nietzsche lays out for evaluating different teachings in that work. So uh, it, I, I used the commentary on Kaimoku Show to look at all the different forms of Buddhism and try to get an understanding of why Nichiren chose the Lotus Sutra and chose the practice he did. And, and it also looks at, at Hinduism, Confucianism, Taoism. As I said, there's a chapter on Western monotheism and, and tries to put it all into that context of the practice and teaching of the Lotus Sutra. Mm. So if we want to participate in your Sangha, uh, we should just email you or uh, email the temples or what we, what we should do? Yes, just go to the website, uh, nichirinbayarea.org, and uh, there's a place where you can uh, sign up for our notices for our group meetings. Uh, right now, we're going to we hold meetings every Sunday at 1230 Pacific time on the first and third Sunday of the month. And uh, we do a... a a Nichiren Buddhist service, and then we uh, have a brief uh, time for checking in with each other, introducing ourselves to each other if there's new people. And about for about an hour after that, we have a, a discussion group where we talk about different Buddhist teachings. Right now, we just started studying the Lotus Sutra, which will probably take us two or three years to do. Uh, also, every Wednesday night, um, my disciple uh, Yugan is uh, holding. Um, uh, should I go practice? And these are all Zoom meetings right now, where because of the sheltering in place, we can't meet in person. So, um, so every Wednesday night, there's a should I go practice through Zoom, and every first and third uh, Sunday we have the regular meetings and the discussions on Zoom. And if the sheltering in place ever ends, we'll we'll have these meetings in person in Oakland. <laughs> So hopefully that will happen sometime late this year or early next year. Um, you know, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really hope so. Uh, yes, that's it for today. So if you think this information is useful, make sure to subscribe my YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and like me on my Facebook because that's how we do it in the 21st century. So thank you so much, Reverend McCormick, for your uh, precious time uh, to teach us about Odaimoku and the Four Siddhanta. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me here.